Hi everyone. Um, very lovely to be here in Brighton. Uh, something that uh, struck me there from that intro was the idea of interactives and breaking down the barriers between all the beautiful but slightly passive visualizations that we're used to. Uh, 3D has been around for a long time. Digital documentation is flourishing um, in heritage. Um, but still, we haven't always quite divorced ourselves from the idea of it just being this, this thing that you present. So to that end, I have a little test for you all. This is interactive. A couple of 3D prints. You want to pass them around? Uh, anyone who can tell me what they are, where they're from, in Winston Brighton Rock. <laughs> Right rock on display. <laughs> I suspect anyone from Scotland has a slight advantage on this one. And Sophia, you're banned, you know. Um, I'm going to talk about the Ray Project. The Ray Project is um, Historic Environment Scotland, the new amalgamated body between the Royal Commission and Ancient Historic Monuments for Scotland and Historic Scotland, as was. Um, came into being uh, last October and uh, this project, the Ray project, kind of preceded that merger um, and has kind of um, recaptioned and retitled uh, what was formerly called basically just properties and care work, so our standard estates work. There was a big desire to try and um, give the projects a, a little bit more momentum. So the idea of we have records for all of our various sites uh, properties in care, um, but there was a big desire to try and um, push that into more of a 3D world. So, in a little summary to remind you, you all pretty much know who Historic Scotland were. To recap, Historic Environment Scotland still has the requirement, the, the necessity to safeguard the historic environment and promote it, um, help people understand it. We're still responsible for our 578 monuments in care, and within that we have 90,000 um, listed buildings and archaeological sites as well. So a lot of sites to manage, um, and a lot of sites to try and manage and um, try and direct resources that um, will help us manage uh, those so within Historic Environment Scotland, I sit within the Conservation Directorate. It's probably the largest part of Historic Environment Scotland. And we um, have the duty of care to record and do any kind of um, maintenance work on the actual sites themselves. So the key thing is recording, researching, and ensuring that the sites basically don't fall down onto people's heads while they're walking around them. Okay, we've got to remember we're there as a service to allow people to wander around our sites, um, learn about the heritage of Scotland, uh, and use every asset at our resource to try and try and help uh, sustain that. The Ray project um, was launched by the first minister in Scotland um, several years ago now. I think it was in 2012, and. Uh, the desire there was to follow up on um, what had been a successfully initiated project called the Scottish 10 project, you may have heard of that, um, which was an effort to showcase 3D digital documentation um, within Scotland uh, and working with partners abroad, digitally documenting sites like Sydney Opera House, Mount Rushmore, um, the Antonine Wall in Scotland, uh, the five Scottish sites and five international sites to go alongside that. What was learned from that and what was thought about when that was instigated was, okay, we're going out to do all these high profile sites, but we really need to start to look a bit more inwards and bring some of these ideas home and start to um, use things like laser scanning, photogrammetry, digital documentation as it is called now for us um, to help us manage the estate and get, get more information out there. So um, in 2014, following on from this process and the, the early fledgling initiation of the Ray Project, incidentally named after John Ray, an Orcadian who 
map the Northwest Passage, but you can go and Wikipedia that and check that all out. Um, this uh, document, Our Place in Time, the Historic Environment Strategy for Scotland was put together, and um, it was seen that to manage our estate, we would need to do something quite radical to try and get data that would actually be useful in a new way um, to, to achieve all the goals on here. This is all available online, so if you want a close look at it, I know it's a bit blurry up there, um, you can have a look at that. Um, the objectives of the Ray project were pretty straightforward. Um, we wanted to provide resources for scientific and technical analysis of our sites. We wanted to have data that would allow us to share, conserve, manage, understand the sites a bit better. Um, we wanted to build stronger links with organisations and agencies within Scotland and, and out with Scotland. We'd already done that with the Scottish 10 project. Um, and I, I suppose at the very core of it was a baseline record. Yes, it would be lovely to say we had a 100% record of all our sites in Scotland, but actually the truth is we didn't and we don't. And so my colleague Sophia, who's sitting in the audience there, was laser scanning the attics at the palace in Edinburgh Castle yesterday. We don't have a record of those. Strange, eh? But you would think we did. Um, we do now. Um, so this is why this was identified as something that uh, was absolutely essential. Um, obviously, why use laser scanning, use photogrammetry? Um, sometimes people find that there are things, there's a little bit of resistance from people who have used other methodology over the years um, and we've all kind of fought through that and broken barriers down to try and get um, people enabled to use 3D data because from our point of view we, we, we've been doing things like recording Mount Rushmore or the fourth bridges, huge data sets, how do you get that out to people? Um, sometimes when you go to somebody and say we've got this data for you they say oh I just want a drawing and that's a very old fashioned kind of standard response that, that I used to receive and I'm sure you guys have, have heard many times. Um, but obviously there are so many benefits of the 3D data set, not least things like the 3D prints that I've handed around, which we've started to do ourselves, which enable the accessibility. So what do we use? We have a whole range of different laser scanners, um, the tool belt, if you like, different resolutions, handheld structured light scanners for detailed small objects and artifacts, um, terrestrial laser scanners, arm um, line scanners. That's quite a nice slide when you can read it. But, <laughs> but um, it basically tells you the resolutions that we work to and the different scanners that we have. Hopefully we can give you a bit more information on that. Um, we had uh, some of the sites that we actually worked on which were part of the Scottish 10 project like Mays Howe and Scarra Bray up in Orkney. Um, I don't think this animation is going to do much on here. But uh, these are all online. There's some nice animations um, from the Maze Howe work up there. That kind of enabled us a sort of quick way into seeing what we could do for the Historic Scotland Estate. So some of these sites are also looked after by Historic Environment Scotland and managed by us, but they also have that, that UNESCO status, um, obviously. And the things that we could actually do with that data, very quickly, we could show our own architects. Here's a view of Maze Howe that you couldn't see before. This is, this is how you can maybe start to use that data in your everyday work. Um, and here's a bit more detail for that. What else could we do with it? What else could we show them? We could start to show them condition monitoring. So we have inscriptions inside Maze Howe, detail, 4D condition monitoring. Um, a whole, I think it's 90 different inscriptions that have been checked over a, um, a sort of six year period. Um, and then on a larger scale, Scarra Bray, coastal site, coastal erosion monitoring. So basically we have a two year cycle going up to this entire uh, archaeological site, fantastic Neolithic site, um, and scanning it with terrestrial laser scanners to give us a little bit of an idea of not what the seawall, the protective seawall around the site is doing, but actually what it's doing to the, the environment beside the seawall. So cutting, you know, is it causing cutting coastal erosion to come in? Um, and what about all those unknown heritage sites or 
suspected heritage sites within that landscape, how can we um, try and mitigate against something happening? So trying to use our data for a, a function. Um, the Ray project, first sites uh, initiated, Edinburgh Castle. We had legacy data, we had existing surveys that had been done, we had things like amazing balloon photography and things like that, which had been done in the 80s. Um, and I was like, can we get this out? Can we do photogrammetry with it? Can we chuck it into Agisoft? All that, all that kind of stuff. Um, but actually, the, the basis of it was we had to go back in. Sorry, that is a terrible slide on there. I'm so sorry for that. But, um, it's sharp on here. Uh, it, basically, we had about 60 key survey control points. We, we went back into Edinburgh Castle. We planned where we were going to um, do our terrestrial laser scanning to get what the Ray project required, which the Ray project required a complete 3D survey of the exteriors and the interiors so that all that data could fit the requirements of our architects and, and our conservation teams. These, are, these colourful blobs are basically the roofs of various different buildings that we went up onto and a schedule that show um, the summer about two years ago of us going to these different locations and trying to capture that data. Uh, and it is absolutely no mean feat but with the experiences of working at places like Sydney Opera House through the Scottish Ten project, we were quite well prepared for, for how to do that. Here's a few images of terrestrial laser scanners on the roof of the barracks block. You'll, anyone who's seen Edinburgh Castle will be familiar with the barracks block. It's a very obvious rectangular building. Um, the tunnel that leads underneath the restaurant area. Um, Mons Meg down in the bottom right hand side. Um, and that's something I should add, actually, is that this project is not just about recording the sites, it's also about recording the artefacts. So within this, we've also um, been trying to capture colour information, not just colour intensity from ter terrestrial laser scanners. So we might be there with a Leica P40 or a Faro um, focus scanner or a C10 laser scanner, um, capturing the overview of these sites, um, but we are also capturing this texture information which the architects find particularly useful. And I've seen it used really effectively in other countries, places like Denmark, um, on Bornholm, there's a, there's a guy there who has a, has a site which he laser scans, he then sends ortho images to his architects who take them out on iPads and they annotate out in the field within hours of the data actually being captured. That's the kind of thing that I want to start doing that can feed into our project um, and which will also feed into um, the, I suppose, understanding and, and sharing of our data. What else do we do? We georeference the data, we give it some context. Um, we use the MapTech laser scanner, which gave us an overview of the entire kind of craggy area of the, the site. Um, I think it has a laser dot about the size of a small dinner plate, but it does reach parts that other scanners can't reach, so uh, it's certainly worth trying. We cube mapped our HDR images onto um, the point clouds, so you can see the museum square and the area just next to the water tanks at Edinburgh Castle. A very basic recording, but just information that we didn't have before. Um, we scanned the interior of David's Tower, so this half moon battery up here. Um, we actually also have the scans inside where there's an archaeological excavation. The scale is not the same as what you just saw. It's very faint on here, but um, you have a tower, the interior of the tower behind that battery, which there really wasn't any image like very, very faint. There's no image like that, actually, but there's, <laughs> there, was, there was no section through this. Nobody had an accurate record of this. So we also have vaults <laughs> below what's called the Devil's Elbow, prison pits and things like that. We have lovely 3D data of that, which we can start to, to use. Um, and so this is really helpful to our architects, helping the understanding. Other sites, Glasgow Cathedral. Um, if you want to see some of these images, a lot of them have actually been tweeted. We're quite good at tweeting, so um, have a look for those. Um, and again, some of the sites are massive. Um, the interiors of Glasgow Cathedral trying to capture all of that, capturing the colour, working when people are, are actively coming in and out of the site, um, 
Kalanish up in the Western Isles. We didn't just stick to architectural sites. There's archaeological sites. There's, um, there's Scottish vernacular sites as well. So we had some of these sites. We tried to manage it in such a way that when we're out recording the sites, we try and pick off as many in that geographical location as possible. And that comes, there's a lot of planning there that, that is quite difficult to manage. High level photography at Kalanish, uh, vernacular architecture at Arnold, Black House in the Western Isles. So we're, the whole the whole range of different kinds of sites. Other things, uh, scientific analysis and research, scale on the isle and logs. This is totally unknown before, as far as I'm concerned. In our department, we have a moisture meter, the only one in the country. Uh, our colleagues have, scientific colleagues, Maureen Young, um, have been to uh, scale on the isle, taken hundreds of readings on the wall. And then my colleague Sophia in the audience has mapped that onto the point cloud. So you may have seen thermal imagery mapped in 3D um, like that. But um, this is basically moisture data mapped on. And what we want to do is have the complete suite of those things. Um, and this starts to feed into this idea of, of BIM and adding value to data. Objects and artifacts. don't have much time, do I? But... Uh, Okay for a, a little bit. Um, this is Elizabeth's first prayer book, one of several that she made. Um, I think it comes of having several mothers. Uh, you make one as a gift, you give it to them to ingratiate yourself. Um, it's looked after by the National Archives of Scotland, and we have what's called a Giga Macro, which is basically a camera mounted on a rig that can take very high detailed panoramic um, images in a, in a grid um, and stacks of images. So basically the camera moves progressively down towards the image. Um, fo the focus stays uh, the same. So each part of the 3D object comes into focus at a different stage. You use what's called stacking software to take the focus part, merge it all together. So you get this giga image of this. We've tried this out. This isn't in our collection for the Ray project, but it's something that we've tried and it's something that's available to us for our, for our objects and artifacts. Um, other things, you've got some free prints out there. You can see that. Um, the objects and artifacts, the parts of um, our built heritage sites. I think you've even got a <coughs> castle out there. Um, the idea being that we can start to maybe put some of that actually out there for people to use for their own interpretation, education. Maybe if we're benevolent, even downloading and printing themselves one day. That would be great. Um, interesting, two different printers we have at the moment for, for getting the rate project data um, out to try and do a little bit of uh, speculation how we can use that. Um, we have a Object 30 Pro and the Cube printer on the right hand side. And difference in price is about, this one costs £31,000, that one costs about £800. So the actual quality on the right hand side is incredibly high. Um, although the difference in microns, I think right hand side 72 microns, left hand side 14 microns, but not bad. Um, Visualising in new ways, <coughs> how, do we, how do we start to get that data out to people? Um, we've actually bought ourselves a whole set of Samsung VR headsets um, and every site that we record, we take these panoramic 360 degree photos. This is the easiest, most effective way to get somebody to a site virtually. No scanning, just imaging. Create your 360 image and no problem at all. Other things that we've been <coughs> trying to include in the Ray project, resources, um, the scan data going towards, Scan, scan for BIM, that buzz word classic, um, which uh, basically the water tanks at Edinburgh Castle. We have the raw data from the castle, which we've been scanning for the last uh, several years or not, and uh, modelled up in this case in Revit. Um, the idea being that at one stage there was, a, there was an idea that this building would be used um, to host a new exhibition. Uh, rather than as its old uh, resource as, a, as an actual water tank. Um, and uh, again, that information um, has actually been very useful to trying to 
mostly trying to help persuade our own in-house team that working with BIM-type data, adding value to your data, it's not just the model, it's the information that actually goes into the model, can really help. Um, and with the launch of the Scottish BIM strategy just last year, this um, also helped to push forward the idea of you know, the Ray project data is there as a, as a resource that can be used to then leapfrog forward um, with uh, scan to BIM and uh, investing the uh, crudely, to put it crudely, the dumb point cloud with something that is a little bit more intelligent. What else? Bit of fun, 3D printing it. Yeah, okay, we can start to do that with that data. Um, and then we can also um, do that for all of our objects as well. So the objects, um, we have 300,000 objects in care. Some of them are suitable for, for printing, some are not. The, the table you have there, we have an equivalent for the properties in care. Um, Two minutes. Okay. Um, and this table is basically like the properties in care, what we did is we went to all our architects and I said, don't give me every site, give me your top 10 that are the ones that are under the most threat, that are the ones that have um, the biggest problems associated with them. Um, and there were several different factors that we put in. Um, we had an achievability factor, how close the site was, how accessible it was, what the health and safety issues were, and we came up with a ranking for the Ray Project sites um, to try and help us understand which order we would do that in. We did the same for the objects. Um, there are a significant number more objects, but we spoke to our collections people, which are the ones that you want us to you know, prioritise. There's many factors in that. Um, and, and they came back with a list, and that gave us a driver to which ones we would record in which order. It was really helpful, actually. And they actually found it really helpful. They'd been quite resistant before, but they found it really helpful once they did it, which is quite interesting. A um, couple of examples of things on the estate that are dark, dingy, and difficult to see. Um, <laughs> this beautiful statue of Mary Queen of Scots actually put into the Lithgow Palace in 2015, um, but we were asked to record it as, as a new um, site. It was actually um, scanned with a P40 laser scanner, rendered in uh, a very generous trial by Geomagic, and then uh, further rendered in ZBrush to the bronze that it actually is. You can't even see that, can you? But never mind. Um, the Stone of Destiny at Edinburgh Castle, we did RTI on this, reflectance transformation imaging. This is actually an image, plan view of it, um, done with an arm scanner, perceptron scanner. Um, Mons Mega, Edinburgh Castle, scanned. Um, and then the idea that we can start to use some of this data for understanding and interpreting things that we didn't necessarily know about other, other things on our estate. We have to store the data, that's obvious. Um, we have a lot of uh, different places to store that data. As you can see, that's, that's my desk. And you can see um, initially a government tape archive, but we now have a 72 terabyte server, and we have cross-compatible storage at Glasgow School of Art for Scottish 10 projects, but we're gonna have some National Archives of Scotland possible storage with them. Um, that's still to be negotiated, but we're trying to work out how that's going to go. Um, we archive the data based on um, advice from our digital archiving colleagues, Emily Nimmo, um, based at Historic Environment Scotland. Uh, and then we are trying to move forward with the visualisation and enabling people to actually get hold of that data and put it out there. So things like true views, web views, videos on YouTube, that kind of stuff. Um, side benefits... People coming and learning with us. Sophia is a Heritage Lottery funded placement. She's, she's just sitting over there. Um, every one of our five placements has gone and got a job in the industry, which is fantastic over the last five years. Um, and that has contributed to the positive drive towards us all moving to a new location in Stirling, which is going to be called the Engine Shed, Scotland's building conservation hub. And we're going to have visualization things there all sorts of different 3D resources, augmented reality tablets. You can't really see, but the top right-hand corner is a map of Scotland, which the idea is you'll hold a tablet up and you'll, you'll see iconic buildings around Scotland popping up on there. Um, and that's it, because okay. I think I've run out of time. You have. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.